hot rise. Yes, good morning. <laughs> My Lord, good morning. Uh, I appear for the appellant with Mr Newman, um, Miss Addy, Queen's Counsel, and Mr Sullivan appear for the first respondent, and Mr Hollander appears for Mr Downs. Right, let me just... Yes, thank you. In terms of housekeeping, my lord, you should have a, a core bundle and a supplemental bundle and authorities from the appellant and authorities from the first respondent, I understand, with various judgments from related proceedings. Um, well, the op I mean, I do have two bundles of authorities that arrived yesterday, yes. and then I see a new bundle that's just appeared, respondent's authorities, right. That's just appeared now, I think, but we do have it. Good. Thank you. I'm grateful, my lord. Uh, this is the oral hearing pursuant to the order of Lord Justice Arnold, who ordered the ent entire permission hearing should be adjourned to this oral hearing. Yes. I accept that uh, Lord Justice Arnold stated that the judgment appears careful and well-reasoned and expressed doubts about whether any of the grounds one to six have real prospects of success, but grounds seven and eight calls uh, his lordship to be troubled and they set the context for some of the assertions in the other grounds. So with your lordship's permission what I intend to do is start with grounds seven and eight and uh, then proceed with the other grounds and spend a few minutes uh, at most on each one. Yes, well that, that sounds <coughs> very sensible if I may say so. Um, just on the matter of timing generally, we've got two hours allotted for this and I was wondering, subject to your views, whether the sensible thing might be to, for you to have a, certainly an hour to set out your stall, um, and then maybe we might have perhaps 20 minutes from the respondent and 10 minutes or 15 minutes from Mr. Hollander, to which you would then have a brief right of reply, something along those lines. Would that um, fit in? With yes, well, I'm very grateful <laughs> for that indication, yes, it would. But if we try to work through that timetable, then of course we will decide at that stage whether we can give you an immediate decision or whether we we'll wish to tell you the result and reasons to follow or indeed just reserve our decision. Yes. Well, I'm, great. I'm grateful for your Lordship's indication. Uh, I, I hope to be less than the hour your Lordship would have allotted me, but... Well, um, nobody, no court has ever yet, to my knowledge, complained about <laughs> time not being taken up. And likewise, very few barristers have ever kept to their time estimate. That's the second right at least to <laughs> that proposition. Fundamentally, my lords, Mr. King strongly denies that he took a bribe and considers that the hearing which reached that conclusion was wrong and unfair and that the judge made various errors of law in reaching that conclusion. Yes. Turning, if I may, to grounds seven and eight. The context of these grounds <coughs> is that there is a separate commercial court claim which made serious allegations against Mr. Downs QC that in the trial in May 2017, he misled the judge about costs and his clients threatened uh, the king's legal representatives with personal consequences if they didn't cause their clients to discontinue. You um, say there is such a claim. That was the one struck out by Mr Justice Cockrell. Yes. And has, has, has there been an appeal against that? There has been an appeal and it was determined yesterday uh, and permission to appeal was refused yesterday by Lord Justice Mayles. And that refusal is in the bundle that I think your lordships have recently been passed up and it appears <coughs> on page 113 to 115 of that bundle. <coughs> thank you. Yes. Thank Essentially, you. Lord 
Justice Mayall says that Mr Justice Cockrell's judgment was good and that there's no arguable point of law. So I accept that the commercial court claim has been determined finally. That was determined on the papers, was it? I mean, yes. without an oral hearing? Yes. Yep. So as you say, that makes it final, yeah. And I also fully accept that the judgment of Mrs Justice Cockerell is unhelpful to my client and that there was significant criticism of the uh, way in which the, the approach my client has taken in the litigation. <coughs> but, my lords, what we say is this. The crucial question about this point, about grounds seven and eight, is what was the situation as it pertained at the trial for Mr. Lennon QC? And the fact that the allegations have now been dismissed post-dating the trial <coughs> doesn't <coughs> change the fundamental unfairness which we say existed at that point. And the point is this, that there is an obligation on counsel to remain independent and that obligation finds its expression in the code of conduct. I can show your lordships where that is in the code of conduct. It's not strictly relevant, but I, I doubt it's going to be gainsaid that there is an obligation for counsel to remain independent. Yes, one rather hopes that would go without saying. But... Uh, and it's a, it's a fundamental obligation for all barristers. And the court itself has a power and indeed an obligation to prevent abuse of its own procedures. And one way in which that power can be exercised is the restraining of counsel from appearing in a case if there is a risk of abuse of its procedures or risk of <clears throat> a lack of independence. But to do that, an application would need to be made. That is, that's the point that the respondents have taken, my lord. I accept that point is taken against me. Yes. Um, I, I respond to that in the following ways. Uh, first, as a matter of fact, this issue was fairly and squarely flagged up in writing at the pre-trial review in a skeleton argument. <coughs> I accept that the point wasn't advanced orally at the pre-trial review, but it was flagged before the court. This and was, sorry, just a bit make sure I'm thinking of the right hearing. This is the hearing before Mr. Justice Miles, is that, yeah, is that yes. right? When he dealt with the, the issue about privilege and exactly. various other matters. Yes, thank you. So, leading and junior counsel appeared for Mr. King in that hearing, and that skeleton argument flagged up the point. Uh, your Lordship <coughs> can see that in the supplemental bundle at page 178, there's an extract from that skeleton argument. <coughs> Bottom of that page, paragraph yes. 37. It flagged up the concern about Mr. Downs being a defendant in a, a tort claim in commercial court in the paragraph 37.2, <coughs> there's a reasonable apprehension of fairness, creating a risk that any order at trial may, yeah. may be set aside on appeal. 
Uh, and the point was made in writing again by Mr. Newman in his skeleton argument for the trial. Now, I fully accept that a formal application was not made. I mean, that's quite an important point, though, isn't it? Because, I mean, just to flag it up in one is one thing, but to, to actually flag it up without following it through with a formal application may give the impression of being, as it were, willing to wound but not to strike, or you know, the other way around. Um, Ye yes. Trying to say something up for an appeal, um, whereas the with real way to deal with the point, I guess, is to take the bull by the horns and you know, make your application. The, that might be the best way to do it, but in my submission, my lord, it's not the only way to do it. And if, if a party indicates to the court, as Mr. King did, that there is a real risk of unfairness by this process, then the court itself has an obligation to ensure that there is a fair hearing. Yes. The obligation is on counsel himself to ensure his own independence. And sub, it, it, if that fails, then the court has an obligation. So there isn't an absolute obligation on a party to make a, an application before a trial. And as far as I'm aware, there's no uh, case which says there is such an absolute obligation. Obviously, it's uh, preferable. And it may even be that there are cost implications if that approach isn't taken, although that point is arguable. But if there is unfairness because of this, then that infects the, the entire entire trial. And my lord, dealing with your question, <coughs> one of the problems facing a party who is concerned about the independence of counsel opposing them mm. is that they don't quite know what the position is at any, at any given stage. And it's very difficult to uh, criticize opposing counsel on this basis. And your lordship will see, my, my lords will see how that played out, in fact, during the hearing. So if I can ask your lordships to turn to page 212 of the supplemental bundle. Yes. This is part of the transcript on day one of the trial. And Mr. Downs was opening the case. So if your lordships look at internal page 25, uh, Mr. Downs is talking about the uh, abandoned uh, or, or collapsed trial. Perhaps if we can take it up going back a page at 211. At the bottom of page internal page 24, Mr. Downs is saying the fraud trial didn't finish the court. We use the epithet that it collapsed. I think I'm told by my junior who is at the hearing court, Mr. Leach, that when Miss Addy used that word, my learned friend Mr. Newman jumped up and said that's not accepted. So let me avoid the word collapse, just stick to what actually happened. Claimants discontinued their claim after witnesses had given evidence without cross examining the defendant's witnesses. Uh, secondly, they made a public apology in open court, the Lord just referred to. Thirdly, they agreed consent to pay all the costs of the defendant on indemnity basis. I doubt we'll get very much more into it. It just says everyone's clear and your lordship's clear. Never said later on down the line that I was saying anything different. We say it's absolutely clear from the documents. Your lordship wants to count through the transcripts. It's absolutely clear what happened in that case. There were two things that happened. Persuaded Mr. King and his family they simply couldn't continue. I'm going to show you that from two documents emanating from Mr. King. And this is where Mr. Newman interjected. He says it's not just an issue in the it's It is just not an issue in the claim, my lord. And it's covered in two commercial court claims, which are currently on foot, where it's hotly contested what happened and why. What my learned friend is doing is speculating about what happened within a legal team. There's a claim between Mr. King and his legal advice involving allegations of bad faith. Um, he says nobody was trying to have that struck out or <coughs> changed, as your lordships know. Uh, and then he he continues, and if, if I can ask Sorry, you... Sorry, uh, the, the, the claim against Mr. King's own legal advice. Oh, I see. What's, yes. what's happened to that? That's, that, that, that been struck that out? Can, no, that hasn't been struck out. That continues. Uh, I beg your pardon. <coughs> uh, and then Mr. Newman yeah. continues, if I can take it up at page 20, 
6, line 7, lest my learned friend can persuade you that in some way speculation about an entirely different case which is currently on foot in the commercial court is going to actually assist you logically to determine the very narrow matter before you. I'm very, very concerned that the court has effectively hear evidence from my learned friend in circumstances where there's been no disclosure, it's not pleaded, it's not covered, no witness mm. statement, it's not about, because this case is not about that in any way. It's very easy to say because the case is discontinued, <coughs> one can simply observe what has been explained. If that were the case, there would not be two commercial court cases about it. In those commercial court cases, my learned friend is the defendant in one of them. That's not something which is easy for counsel to raise at trial. But one of the concerns we have is that if my learned friend acts in this case, and the temptation to get into matters which are relevant to other cases he's involved in, that's simply just not relevant to what your lordship has to decide. <coughs> so what my learned junior was doing was adverting to the very problem that we now rely on as a ground of appeal and indicating to the court how difficult that was for him to raise, but that it must be raised. I mean, having raised that point, the court was then alerted to the you know, the need to be, be well, to, to bear it bear it in mind, um, and indeed the judge then said he, he thought it would anyway be only of peripheral relevance, if any, that he was not going to stop Mr. Downs from saying what he wants to say. So I mean that set a scene, set the scene for the pr way the trial progressed, with the point having been raised by your junior and taken on board. But I mean it's not as though he went on to say I'm now here by applying. A, no. Re representation must be changed even at this 11th hour or anything like that. I accept that. He didn't. And of course there's also this point. I mean, we're, we're talking here about a very experienced leading counsel who must have considered the position himself and formed a view that it was proper for him to continue, at least for him to continue to act. And yes. in a normal way, one, one, you know, one ought to trust the instincts and judgment of counsel on a point like that, unless it's absolutely clear that there's been something that's gone badly wrong. I, I accept that's the normal way that one must normally approach cases, but in this case, the, the facts are extreme in that it's very unusual for counsel himself to be a defendant in related proceedings, and in, in this case, uh, what happened was that counsel cross-examined on... Well, counsel was a defendant in other proceedings because, as Mrs Justice Cockrell found, he'd been joined to the proceedings on the basis of an unsustainable claim that should not have been brought. I accept so that. So the, the, the argument I think you're advancing is because a claim had been brought against him which ought never to have been brought, he ought not to have been acting. With benefit of hindsight, my lord, that is that is the way it appears now. Well, I, it may it may not have appeared to him very differently at the time. That's right. That it may have appeared on that basis. But what counsel shouldn't be able to do, with great respect, my lord, is cross-examine on the case in which he is a defendant in unrelated proceedings. This well, I, I, I understand your point, but the, the, the logic and effect of it is that you can prevent your opponent from having their chosen counsel by making an unsustainable allegation of fraud against them in other proceedings. If, if it, I, I'm not, I don't think it's ever been suggested that Mr Downs was uh, brought into the commercial court proceedings simply to try and get rid of him in these proceedings. Yes, sorry, it was expressly, I expressly made that submission before Mr. Justice Cockrell on Monday. Oh, we I said and we say that there are very good grounds for believing this. Well, I apologise if that, if that has been suggested. But it, it's still the position, my lord, that uh, in this case it was wrong for counsel to cross-examine about the case in which he was a defendant. If it's right that the case in which he was a defendant was hopeless, it should never have been mentioned by counsel. And what 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 counsel did? I was, I'm sorry, my lord. I was speaking. I was about no, 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 speaking no, 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 keep speaking going. Keep going. What, what counsel did, we say, was improperly rely on uh, what has turned out to be a hopeless claim in order to colour the judge's 
view in this claim against my client. So if I, if I, can I show your Lordship's three references very quickly in which uh, Mr. Downs was cross-examining about what we say were entirely irrelevant matters in the other claim. These are in the supplemental bundle. <clears throat> I can ask your Lordship to look at supplemental bundle page 251. Um, at the bottom of internal page 174, uh, Mr. Downs is asking, you think some of your evidence that Mr. Marcus Smith was by accident over the top of page 175? The answer is no, and so on. And then he said, you want to change that part of your evidence. Mr. Newman interrupted, saying it's a different case. It's nothing to do with this one. Mr. Downs says it's a rather, rather lot to do with it, very relevant to credit. There's an awful lot in that case that will hang on this witness's credit. So what he was doing there was cross-examining on it, what we say is irrelevant matters simply on credit to di to colour adversely the judges. Well, why, why are they relevant? The, the, the cross exam the line of cross examination was to the effect you you've said something now which is inconsistent with the evidence you gave not in the fraud action against Mr Downs as I understand it but in the first set of proceedings the ones that were uh, uh, abandoned. Why, why, is, why is that not relevant to credit? The, the context, the context was disputed, my lord. And what what Mr. What Mr. Downs was doing was allowing his own knowledge and uh, feelings about the other claim to to be put to use in this claim. That's what. That's the point, my lord. So how would how would that have differed from what an independent counsel would have done with the knowledge? That we say Mr. independent Downs counsel had. wouldn't have cross-examined at all on this point. Well, in, in a case. Case before Mr. Lennon depended heavily on credit. There were, there were uh, you say, no corroborating features. You say essentially it was one person's word against another. And uh, if in previous proceedings evidence had been given and evidence was being given before Mr. Lennon, which it was suggested was inconsistent with that, that would be a perfectly proper line of cross-examination for anyone to take. Can I, I have one moment, please? Yeah. Yeah, I, my Lord, there was no evidence from anyone about the evidence that had been given before the other judge, and so it's just um, Mr. Downs' personal knowledge that he's bringing to bear on that point. The, the second point, my lord, is at 261. Internal page 132. <coughs> where Mr. Downs is cross-examining Mr. King on the quantum of the claim that he is bringing against Mr. Downs. And at 262, page 168, internal page 168, Mr. Downs is suggesting in those questions that the claim against him is vexatious. And independent counsel wouldn't have been cross-examining on the quantum of a claim against Mr. Downs in these proceedings. And the only reason he was doing that was to colour this judge's view of my client in these proceedings. And that worked. And, and so we say that the lack of independence 
prejudiced the court and, and meant the case was in unfairly presented. And the skeleton argument drafted by Mr Newman makes the point about various other grounds of appeal in which uh, that has led into the way in which the case is presented. One stark way is in respect of ground three. And ground three, and I'm sorry, my Lord, I've finished with ground seven and eight. I've set out my stall there, and I'm moving on to ground three. And ground three is the decision about quantum which underpins the judge's conclusion that there was a bribe. So it was KSL's pleaded case that the company rented the Range Rover from TCH and paid for the car by giving up profit share payments it would otherwise have been entitled to, uh, which totaled £47,000. Uh, and you can see that in the amended particulars of claim at page 151 of the core bundle. So sorry, which page again? 151, my lord. Thank you. Paragraph 48, core bundle, causation and remedies. As a result of the matter set out above, the claim has suffered loss and damage as follows. And A, it's the amended claim is that it estimates its claim with respect to lost profit share is 47,000 odd, calculated as follows. And that emerged, that working emerged uh, in correspondence, which is important which appears in the supplemental bundle at page 93. So there's correspondence between the parties. And page 93 is a letter from the first respondent, solicitors. And if your lordship to go over the page to 93, Four, the top of that page deals with the profit share for 14, 2014, 2015, 2016. And then it says, thus the correct total figure, including the estimated figure of 11,000 for 2015, for the years 2015 to 17, is 47,000 odd, not 40,666.47, as we'd state in the, in the claimant's RFI. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. We and our client apologise for what was an inadvertent mistake, misinterpretation of the data. Um, avoidance of doubt, the above figures are net sums. We shall amend and reserve the replies to RFIs accordingly. However, the way in which the case was put at trial was on the unamended sum. So the judge dealt with this point at paragraphs 152 and 153 of the judgment, page 104 of the core bundle. So is the complaint the judge should have given judgment against our client for a larger sum than he did? That's a rather odd ground of appeal. Yeah, yeah, I accept that. Normally it is, my lord, but the, the, the working shows it was crucial in this respect. Because what the judge says is that the, the profit share of the lower amount, the 40,666, wouldn't cover the ordinary rental cost. But the higher amount, the 47,000, would easily have covered it. You gave us the paragraph number, but I didn't notice it. It's my fault. 152 and 153, my lord, on page 104. So the argument from Mr Newman set out at 151 that was that TCH ensured all its costs were met by KSSL via the profit share and TCH did no more than provide the Range Rover. 152 the judge says I accept that TCH agreed to do, to do so. All that TCH agreed to do 
was to sim was to buy a Range Rover fully paid for by KSL's Mr. King, the transaction might not have constituted a bribe. But Mr. Down submitted that TCH did provide a benefit to Mr. King by one, assuming the risk that the profit share might not cover the ordinary rental costs of the vehicle, and that's the point, and two, breaching its own procedures by providing a personal as opposed to corporate lease. But no one at this stage knew what the actual profit share was going to be. This was a this was uh, the, the actual profit share foregone for the purposes of the quantum of the claim could be viewed in retrospect, but it depended on the number of cars that were going to be uh, returned over the period. At the stage at which the risk is being taken, no one knows how much the profit share is going to be, do they? Uh, I accept that, but the, the figure advanced was the 40,666 figure, my lord. You can see that at the bottom of paragraphs 152. That's what it turned out to be. No, that, that was the wrong figure. I think the, the 47,000 figure was the corrected, amended figure. That yes, but I, but I understand, I understand what you're saying, but what the judge is here saying in support of his view that there was a risk taken about whether the profit share would cover the cost of the Range Rover is that there was a risk. Uh, and the fact that it later turned out to be a particular figure, whether it was 40,000 or whether it was 47,000, wouldn't have any impact would it, on, on the fact that a risk was being taken. The, um, the way in which it was worked, the way in which the agreement was worked out was evidenced in an email that appears at page 6263 of the bundle. Of the core bundle? Of the core, yeah, the same bundle. It's, par it's quoted by the judge at paragraph 54 of the judgment. So at the top of page 63 of the bundle your lordship has is an email from TCH saying that the rental three lines down, the rental on this is circa one one thousand two hundred per month, which means I need to have around twenty nine thousand available for me overall profit share. I'm sorry, I must be on the wrong page. Aren't I? It's my fault. Please sorry, give me the page fault. again. Um, it is in paragraph fifty four on pages sixty two and sixty three. All right, so I see it over the page. Thank you. So at the top of I've just read from the top of page sixty three. And there was no direct evidence from TCH as to its calculation in April 2015 of the likely profit share for the three-year period. And so all, all the only figures I understand it that were the amended figures, the, the, the figures that the uh, KSSL was relying on were the amended figures. But for whatever reason, the unamended figures were advanced at this point. May I have one moment? I'm told that those the lower figures weren't advanced on the basis that that was an estimate, whereas the later figures were the actual figures. So your lordship's point wasn't the basis upon which those that difference was advanced. No, I I quite understand your your point. Um, there may be other uh, matters one needs to come to it, but I quite understand your point that the actual profit share, after after, after it could be calculated. Uh, was uh, the 47,000 figure, not the 40,000 figure that the judge awarded and referred to as how it turned out. But the, as my Lord puts you, that doesn't help you very much so far as quantum is concerned. No, You're no. seeking to employ it to say it, it infected the judgment and the judge made a fundamental error yes. in treating the estimate of the profit share as giving rise to a risk that the profit share wouldn't cover the cost of the Range Rover. And if one's looking at what the estimates were, neither the figure of 40,000 or 47,000 were relevant. You've drawn our attention to this, which is on the basis that when it was going to be a two-year deal, there was an estimate that it would need to be about 29,000 for, for two years. But the, the judge's point, and I'm not at the moment understanding what your answer to it is, 
is that nobody knew at that stage what the actual profit share was going to be. And therefore, in foregoing three years profit share, TCH were taking a risk that it wouldn't be sufficient to cover the cost of the range review. That, that as I understand it, was the judge's point. Yes. And, and what's wrong with that? May I comment? The, 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 the ultimate point is, is that if the 47,000 rather than the 40,000 figure were used, then the, the risk would have been so much smaller. Because what the... Uh, used, the figure, used, used, used for what? Used as the, if the quantum judge, of the claim which everybody knew in hindsight, or used yeah. as the estimate at the time. There's no, there's no suggestion that anybody was able to estimate it exactly at the time. No, I accept that. But if if the judge had in mind the forty seven thousand figure, he may well have come to a different conclusion on the risk that the profit share would not cover the ordinary cost of rental. That's the point I'm I'm trying to make. So we say that the the case, as at the amended case, signed by a statement of truth, was the case evidenced before the judge and should have been advanced. And it was an error for the judge not to have used the 47,000 rather than the 40,000 figure. He did. He un used the unamended rather than the amended figure. The, the respondents say that the, the 40,000 figure was the one that was verified in the evidence in Mr. Forsyth statement, and that was the figure that was put to Mr. King in cross-examination, and that was the figure he accepted. Is, is that right? I don't, dis I don't, dis I'm not in a position to dispute any of that. But so, what so, so was the judge not entitled to proceed on the basis of the evidence rather than uh, the pleaded case if they put forward in evidence a lower figure? Well, the, the respondent should have, uh, should have at least explained the difference between its pleaded case subject to a statement of truth and the evidence. And the reason the reason it's so important, my lord, is because the judge relied on that on the lower ground in order to make come to the conclusion that there was a bribe. Thank you. Turning to ground one, um, the conclusion of the judge that Mr. King took a bribe. We say that was wrong. There are two main points under this head. Um, first, there was no benefit from the third party with, which Mr. King knew about. I've already made uh, submissions about that on the £47,000 point. Uh, and the other, the other points that Mr. Uh, that, this, that was said that meant that <coughs> Mr. King took a bribe were very minor points, like, for example, the providing a personal as opposed to a corporate lease. And I, I'm told that wasn't put in cross-examination to Mr. King. And secondly, there was no secrecy about the process. And crucially in this respect, we rely on the discrepancy between Mr. Telemach's witness statement and what he said in evidence and the failure by the judge to deal with this. So in Mr. Telemach's witness statement, I'm sorry to interrupt again, I'm interrupting a lot, but just before we embark on this, why does Mr. Telemach's knowledge matter? Uh, given that the judge found that what was necessary was disclosure to the board, and he wasn't a member of the board, was he? Uh, because his his evidence was that um, he he knew about it. It would be it would put. But let's assume that would, assume that to be so. Assume that you're right in saying the judge ought to have found on the evidence that Mr. Telemach knew about it. I'm putting to you a slightly different point, yes, which I is know. that the judge's finding was that what was necessary by way of disclosure was disclosure to the board. So his knowledge wouldn't have been sufficient. It would put a very different complexion on the case if uh, the various people that Mr. King said knew about it were held to have known about it. Uh, 
So that would, if, if the judge had found, as he should have done, that Mr. Telemach knew, then it would have caused him to reassess his other conclusions. I have one moment. And, th and this is in the context, of, as Mr. Newman reminds me, that uh, secrecy was a, an important part of what was alleged. So if I can show your Lordship very quickly this point. Yeah, thank you. Um, page 193 of the bundle. Of the supplemental bundle, I apologise. Yeah. He says, I did, up, I did end up knowing how the Range Rovers were funded. Yes, you did, up end, up, you did end up knowing. Mm -hmm. You can see it's really a bit unfair to put a witness statement before the court in a case against Mr King, isn't it? Saying that you were all very frustrated about an apparent deal behind your back. That's obviously a reference to the paragraph 35 I just quoted to your lordship. When that wasn't true, you, you can... Obviously, you're missing out a word there. You can see how it's a bit unfair to Mr. King, isn't it? And the answer is yes. Uh, so uh, he agreed that it was unfair to put in an untrue witness statement. And it's common ground that Mr. King's Range Rover was funded by the profit share payments. So we say that it's clear that what he was accepting there was that he knew how the Range Rovers were funded. Uh, and well, you may be right, but. He does say, I did end up knowing. I'm just looking at that passage on its own. I'm, it's not apparent whether that, that means he knew at the time. I, I accept, it may be. It may be but I, I accept that. That point is taken by the respondents, my lord. I mm. accept that. Yeah, that there is a, an ambiguity there. But what isn't ambiguous is that he accepted it was unfair to put an untrue statement in his, his witness statement. And it was obviously the paragraph that I was referring to that was being agreed to be untrue. But that crucial point wasn't dealt with by the judge. Uh, and your lordships can see in the core bundle at page 53, paragraph 23. The judge says in his witness statement he said he was told by Mr. Evans in 2015 that the two Range Rovers were personal vehicles for Mr. King and Mr. Evans, but he only discovered the rentals from Mr. King's Range Rover had been paid for by the profit share arrangement in 2017 after Mr. King's departure. I consider that Mr. Telemat is an honest witness who is seeking to assist the court. <coughs> so the judge there uncritically it appears, accepted a version of events which the witness had repudiated orally in his oral evidence and accepted was untrue. But is that, yes, I know, but, but I mean, it, it may be, I mean, the whole point depends when he got that knowledge, doesn't it? I mean, you, you accept it was ambiguous, and it looks as though the judge resolved the ambiguity by accepting the evidence that was only in 2017, after Mr. King's departure, when he obtained that knowledge. I mean, was that not a finding of fact open to him? Well. At the very least, my lord, the judge, on, on a, a, a point as important as this of knowledge, the judge is obliged to set out his reasons for why he accepts uh, a witness to be an honest witness when the witness himself has said that his witness statement was untrue in that respect. But at the very least, it's a critical obligation, civil justice system, that the judge has to explain why he's accepted or rejected a crucial central piece of evidence. 
we are at a disadvantage. An appellate court is always at a disadvantage. And it's a disadvantage which isn't necessarily remedied by having a transcript. We all know that transcripts uh, don't portray norms and so on. Sometimes people just say yes briefly as if moving the question on. Sometimes it's perfectly clear to the judge that the witness is accepting the, the proposition. Um, but pointing to that, it's that one word, yes, isn't it, that essentially in the transcript you found this submission on uh, uh, in relation to the suggestion put in cross-examination that it was unfair to uh, criticise. It's, it's, it's one... one it's um, it's, it's one, one has to exercise a degree of caution, perhaps, as an appellate court, um, in, in saying that the trial judge uh, was not entitled to make the finding of fact which he clearly made at paragraph 23. I, I fully based on that uh, answer in the transcript, which we know nothing really about the, 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 the tone of or what was really meant. I mean, we've all, we've all had experience of a transcript showing a witness saying yes when everybody who's at the trial knows that they weren't assenting to the proposition. Um, but there we are. It's what we know, with great respect, my lord, what we know from the transcript at page 248 of yes. the supplemental bundle is that the question before was about the fact that Mr. Telemach had agreed he ended up knowing. And then the question to which he says yes is a response to an assertion that it was unfair to put something untrue in your witness statement. So although the word yes is what I'm relying on, the context is a crucial question about un an unfairness based on an untrue statement. And so th that is uh, the sort of evidence that is critical in a trial, and that a judge, uh, with great respect, is obliged to explain if he's going to simply to accept that the witness was honest after the witness himself accepted what he said was untrue. Uh, so for those reasons, my lord, under ground one, we say the conclusion on secrecy and the fact that Mr. King took a bribe was wrong. Um, ground two is the judge's conclusions on breach of fiduciary duty. Uh, and we say these are fatally undermined why, when, because the judge failed to set out again why he preferred the evidence of Mr. Evans in crucial uh, respects. Um, what the judge said was at paragraph 20 on the page before the conclusion about Mr. Kellermatt, page 52. Uh, that um, Mr. Evans, fifth line down, had no reason to lie or falsely to implicate his friend. Yep. We say... Do we need to read the following sentence? Yes. Yes. We say, my lord, there were obvious reasons, and the reasons being that he'd settled with the claimant on terms that he provide an agreed witness statement that Mr. King knew of a profit share. So the reasons for him to lie was to obtain a favourable <coughs> settlement and not to become a defendant. Uh, and those, those points are not considered by the judge. So we say, my lord, that fatally undermines the judge's conclusions in respect of Mr. Evans. On ground four, this is the duty to mitigate. Mr. King uh, says that the claimant has a duty to mitigate. And the judge found as a fact that KSSL had been offered £65,000 by TCH. That's at paragraph 193, page 118. But he concluded, and the concluding paragraph is the important one, at paragraph 
199 on page 120. that the duty to mitigate was not engaged because of the rule in the Liverpool number two, which avoids the need to consider it at all. We say, my lords, that's a mistake of law, and that the rule in the Liverpool number two is about the right to choose which defendant to proceed against, uh, and that defendants liable to the same damage are not able to claim that no loss is suffered because another person is also at fault, but has nothing to do with mitigation. And I made good that submission by a judgment of this court in Peters and East Midlands, and that's in our authority bundle behind tab 14. concerns a PI claim against an authority, a health authority and a doctor, and the local authority was joined as a part 20 defendant, and it was argued that a statutory right to recover from the local authority meant that there should be no recovery from the defendant. But as your lordships can see in their head note, not at head note 2 on page 49 of the report, the, princ the principle that claimant was free to choose from whom to recover compensation had nothing to do with mitigation of loss, and that a claimant was entitled as of right to pursue a claim against a tort loser rather than to rely on a statutory obligation. If I can show you briefly where this point arises in the case, at paragraph 21 and 22, page 61 of the report, the court sets out what the issues are. The first is whether the judge is right to hold the statutory wording referred to all sums, and that's not relevant. And the other issues are raised by the defendant's appeal. The second issue, paragraph 22, is whether the judge was right to hold that even if matters were otherwise equal as, as between relying on the local authority and recovering from the defendants, the claimant would be fully entitled as a matter of law to choose to pursue the tort feasors. And this is the second issue, as it's called, is picked up at paragraph 33, <coughs> page 64 of the transcript. Where the judge, the court of appeals says, quite law, the claimant has distinct rights of action against more than one wrongdoer in respect to the same loss. He can recover against more, provided he doesn't recover in total more than the amount of loss. As far as we're aware, this principle has never been expressed as having anything to do with the rule that the claimant must take all reasonable steps to mitigate the loss caused to him by the defendant's wrong, and that he cannot recover damages for any such loss which he could have been avoided but has failed through unreasonable action to avoid. This principle has been applied to cases where the claimant has the right of action against the wrongdoer and the statutory right to recover the same loss against him from public authority. An example of such a case is the Liverpool. We discussed this case below. And the discussion is from paragraph 37 onwards. So paragraph 37 describes the background, and at 38 there is a quotation from the Liverpool from the judgment from Lord Justice Harmon. And in the quotation, just above G, Lord Justice Harmon says, as to the second part of the President's decision, that's the decision below in the Liverpool case, this case in our judgment has nothing to do with the duty to mitigate damages. And that point there is picked up by the court in Peters and East Midlands at paragraph 41. So after a discussion at 39 to 40 about a different case, the court says, we have difficulty seeing how Lord Justice Stevenson in the, I think it's the London and South England Building Society case, was able to say that the Liverpool is authority for any proposition in relation to a mitigation of damages. As we have seen, Lord Justice Harmon expressly said that the decision had nothing to do with the duty to mitigate. It was a decision about the plaintiff's legal right to cover from whichever liable party it wished. The principle that claimant is free to choose from whom to recover compensation 
has nothing to do with mitigation of loss. And that's the point we are making here, my Lord. So what, in this case, the judge said, I don't need to consider mitigation at all because Liverpool, mean, Liverpool the rule in Liverpool means I don't need to think about what the offer meant. But that's a mistake of law because although there was no obligation to pursue anyone else for the money, the judge should have taken it into account as to whether or not the claimant had mitigated in respect of that amount. But if that's right, why wouldn't that have been a complete answer in the Liverpool number two as well, if money had been offered? It, because, because, my lord, it was about the right to pursue uh, an alternative tort visa, as, as Peters and East Midlands uh, indicate. It's not, it's not about mitigation. Well, may not the true view be that where the doctrine, the Liverpool doctrine applies, to that extent, it sort of trumps any duties to mitigate, which might otherwise arise from, from the facts of the case. I mean, as was the case in the Liverpool. The, the way in which we put it, my Lord, is that the rule in the, and I refer, re, I authority for the way in which we put it is the Peters case, is that the rule in the Liverpool is nothing to do with mitigation at all. And that the the cases are always fact sensitive, and where, as in this case, there is a significant offer uh, from a, another party, then the judge had an obligation to consider it as part of his uh, determination on the facts at trial. That that was the position in the Liverpool mm. that, that the ten thousand pounds had been offered by the owners of the of the wreck, uh, and it was held that because there was no duty to pursue them. That simply didn't have to be brought into account at all. My, my Lord, yes, may I have one moment? Yes, yes. Uh, Mr Newman reminds me that the, the offer in the Liverpool was significantly less than the amount claimed, uh, whereas here the offers are... are the offer was somewhere in the region of the total amount of damages. And so there's a rational reason for saying that there was no obligation on the claimant to pursue another tort visa. Well, mitigation works pro tanto. I you can, fa you that can fail to mitigate by failing to take something which would reduce but not eliminate the cost. The, the, the point was before m Mr Justice Miles in the PTR and how he dealt with it is instructive. There is a, a one page extract in the supplemental bundle from his judgment, but it makes the point. Page 199, if I may, of the supplemental bundle. This argument arose in the context of um, disclosure about privileged documentation. Uh, but the conclusion he, he comes to at paragraph 49 is instructive. It says, in any event, I agree with counsel for Mr. King that the point is arguable. Issue about damages and mitigation are fact sensitive. While it may be the case, for instance, that the creditor is not required to take active steps to recover from a co debtor or joint tort visa before taking proceedings against another debtor, the position may be different where the creditor has chosen negotiate with the solvent co-debtor and to reach agreement in principle with it to choose to pursue the other debtor. This is an issue to be determined at trial. The conclusion of the judge was he didn't need to determine that at all and that no fact-sensitive matters needed to be determined because there was a bright rule, bright line rule from the, Lord, from the Liverpool case which means that mitigation simply doesn't need to be considered. We say that's wrong. I note the time and I'm going to be as brief as I can with the two last grounds. Um, ground five is the judge's decision to refuse the monetary counterclaim. We say that's wrong. And this is about Mr King's right to counter restitution. We say that if rescission was granted, a necessary condition of that relief should have been for counter restitution. Um, and this is not a a new case, as has been suggested in the respondent's notice. The point about counter-restitution was raised in the uh, 
opening skeleton argument. And you can see that, my lords, at page 202 of the supplemental bundle at paragraph 44.2. The judge himself recognised that it was an issue to be considered in the judgment in the core bundle at page 112, which is in, in, within page paragraph 173, subparagraph 32. Page 112, subparagraph 32 on that page. And the judge dealt with this saying that there had been affirmation in uh, at paragraph 183 of the judgment, page 115. And at 183 sets out various reasons why there was no affirmation. And at 1834, he says, two letters in the P45 did not amount to unequivocal representations as to the validity of the settlement agreement. So what had happened, my lords, is that there'd been a settlement agreement um, terminating Mr. King's employment by mutual agreement. And thereafter, the P45 uh, and letters um, with the leaving date were sent out. And the judge said uh, that those documents were not unequivocal representations as to the validity of the settlement agreement. <coughs> we say that's wrong. He goes on, those documents recognise the termination of Mr King's employment and are consistent with the settlement agreement. So that's all plainly right. But it would, in my judgment, be wrong to regard them as amounting to an unequivocal manifestation of an intention to proceed with the implementation of the settlement agreement. Mr. King's employment by KSSL had come to an end, pausing there, it had come to an end because it had been agreed mutually to come to an end pursuant to the settlement agreement. It, employment contracts don't terminate automatically or, by, or, or magically. Um, there's always a reason for termination. One is mutual agreement, another is dismissal, resignation is a third, there are various other reasons like frustration, but none of those are advanced. The only basis on which termination occurred here was the settlement agreement. The judge concluded that uh, Mr King's employment by KSSL had come to an end and would have come to an end irrespective of the settlement agreement given the breakdown in relationship between Mr King and KSSL. The ending of Mr King's employment was a state of affairs which existed independently of the settlement agreement and recognition, recognition of that state of affairs couldn't reasonably have been understood as affirmation. That, that can't be right. Termination of a, employment is not a state of affairs. There must be a means by which employment is terminated. And the means in this case was the settlement agreement. Um, it, it, it may well have been, had the settlement agreement not been entered into, that employment would have continued for a longer period or that Mr. King would have brought an unfair dismissal claim. Well, is that the right counterfactual? The, the, the judge found that the settlement agreement failed to be rescinded because there had been a misrepresentation in the sense of a suppression of Mr. King's breach of his fiduciary duties. If that misrepresentation had not been made, there would have been disclosure. There would not have been the suppression. And Mr. King would have revealed at the time of the settlement agreement uh, that he had been in breach of his fiduciary duties in the way the judge found. On that counterfactual, not only would the agreement have been set aside, but his employment would have been terminated immediately and summarily for that misconduct. So that the counterfactual you're, you're presently relying on, as I understand it, 
is that there's a there's a benefit, a counter benefit, counter restitutionary benefit, which falls to be taken into account, which was the benefit to the company of having his continued services because they would not have been able to and would not have dismissed him at least for a period of time. But is that the right counterfactual on the judge's findings? The the evidence from uh, the claimant was that it would have been uh, had he had the settlement agreement not been entered entered into, it would have been a long, onerous, and challenging process. And that I'm I'm quoting from um, cross examination at page two two six of the uh, supplemental bundle. Cross examination of Mr. Ziedler. But sorry, is that is that a process which assumes no knowledge of the misconduct in relation to the Range Rover? That's that's mismanagement generally. Y yes. I'm putting to a slightly different point, which is if the right counterfactual is knowledge of uh, misconduct in relation to the Range Rover. Uh, it seems to me not only could the company terminate it, but it seems reasonably apparent from what was being said that they would. It, it, at the very least, there would have been had to have been a process, even even where there is gross misconduct, there has to be a fair process. And if there isn't a fair process, um, that gives rise to a possibility of a claim in the employment tribunal. But uh, it, notwithstanding um, misconduct on behalf of a claimant, um, they can still be unfairly dismissed. And so what uh, Mr. King, by not having any restitution, has lost out on is a possibility of such a claim. But the, um, the undertakings, the, what's happened is that KSSL have offered undertakings to the court about employment claims being entertained. But the problem is that doesn't meet the situation faced by Mr. King. The termination of employment was by mutual agreement, and that fact hasn't changed by rescission of the contract. His, his employment did end, and it did uh, end by mutual agreement. So he couldn't possibly bring a claim for unfair dismissal, because there was no dismissal. So that any, any um, undertaking in respect of employment claims from KSSL is meaningless. And we say there's no proper um, counter restitution <coughs> given by the judge. But, uh, well, what it, the benefit that he's lost is the opportunity to bring a claim which would have failed, that summary dismissal well, for gross misconduct wasn't justified. It, it wouldn't necessarily have failed, mind you, uh, because you can be unfairly dismissed even if you have committed misconduct. And there was a settlement value in any such, in any such proceeding. The company wouldn't have wanted <coughs> to uh, have involved itself in it. And that's part of the reason why it did have reached the settlement agreement in the first place. And where do we see that in pleaded as the, as the restitutionary benefit or advanced in the discussion I'm having? Um, that, that wasn't specifically pleaded, my lord. I've shown you in the skeleton argument where, how it was advanced. That's how it was advanced. I'm acutely aware of the time. I'm, I've got one more point. Um, I'm sorry, I've been interrupting a lot of time. No, no, it's, it's, well, I know you've had a lot of ground to cover, um, Mr Solomon, so if you could try to wrap up within five minutes or so. That would be... I, I will do that, my lord. Um, ground six is my last ground. And this is the, the decision to refuse the tort counterclaim. We say that was wrong. Um, it, it's common ground that the tort would be the tort would be established if the pre predominant purpose of the action was to obtain shares. And that's the basis on which the court approached this question at paragraph 230, page 130 of the core bundle. And the respondents say that the question of improper motive is a question of fact for the trial judge. We say that the relevant facts weren't in dispute, and the real question is 
what inference to draw from those facts. And inferences can be more readily challenged on appeal than findings of fact. I'm not sure that's right. I mean, normally inferences are treated very much like any other finding of fact, and all the plethora of guidance from the Supreme Court and this court, I mean, over the last five years. Well, I, my Lord, I accept, it's a, I accept that it, the primary factual, uh, the, the, court, the high court below is the, the place where primary facts should be determined. But based on what uh, was agreed and as set out in the judgment at paragraph 231, and based on those facts, we say that the only, uh, or those factors, we say the only proper conclusion is that uh, an improper purpose should have been found. And I rely in particular on three points in this respect. First, that an extraordinary amount of money, two and a half million in costs, was spent by KSSL chasing a debt of around 50 and in that context, KSSL turned down an offer of compensation from a solvent co-debtor. Um, secondly, uh, the, there are board minutes which the judge refers to at paragraph 2311 directly li linking uh, the case to obtaining the shares. Uh, and thirdly, the approach taken by KSSL, which was to uh, um, use phrase like reaping the whirlwind uh, in connection with pursuing this case. So the judge, when determining what the motive was, um, accepts at the bottom of page 234 that the proceedings were not brought for the predominant purpose of obtaining compensation, but says they were not brought for the improper purpose alleged by Mr. King. It, instead, he finds at paragraph 250, page 137, that the real purpose is the anger felt by Mr. Stiefel and Mr. Fisher towards Mr. King, compounded by the anger at the allegations of dishonesty. But we say, my lords, in the context of what are undisputed facts, the only proper inference was that the purpose of the was obtaining the shares, and we say that's an improper purpose. I'm grateful. Thank you very much, Mr. Solomon. So, Ms. Addy, you're going to go next. Oh, I'm grateful to you all. I'm glad to be seen as I'm wearing my mask. Yes, that's um, okay. Take your time to <laughs> get in. <laughs> uh, my, Lord, my Lord, following an eight day trial, during the course of which the judge heard from 11 witnesses, Considered numerous documents and lengthy written and oral submissions from the parties. The learned judge of the Lordship Proceeding gave a detailed and carefully reasoned 93 page judgment in which he reached the following material conclusions. Firstly, that the ongoing directors of King's Securities Systems Limited, which I'll refer to as KSSA, including Mr. Stiefel, Mr. Fisher, Mr. Zeidler, Mr. Forsyth, and Ms. Shaw, were all honest. Secondly, that the former chief financial officer, no longer employed by KSSL, Mr. Crowell, had been an honest and reliable witness. Thirdly, that in relation to Mr. Stephen Evans, the former CRO who'd been summarily dismissed by KSSL when it was discovered that he'd asked a member of staff to conceal from the board information concerning unauthorised expenditure by members of the King family. And whilst expressly acknowledging that there were grounds for doubting the credibility of the witness, his evidence, so the judge found, concerning Mr. King's knowledge of the payment arrangements 
underlying the Range Rover transaction was in fact honest and reliable and consistent with statements that he'd made to Mr. Simmons by the second time. By contrast, Anthony King, whose evidence lasted for two and a half days, was considered alongside the documentary evidence and the evidence of Mr. Evans, so the judge found neither reliable nor honest. The judge noting in particular, that see paragraph 27 of the judgment, that Mr. King came across as an intelligent man with an eye for detail and that his evidence in relation to his lack of knowledge about the funding arrangements was inherently implausible and that his attempts to reconcile it with the text messages he exchanged between him and Mr. Stephen Evans in 2017 was unconvincing. My lords, it's in those circumstances that Mr. King now seeks permission to appeal, taking issue with the trial judge's factual findings and assessment of the various witnesses' credibility. And as this court well knows, to succeed upon any such appeal, Mr. King would ultimately need to persuade your lordships that no reasonable judge could have reached the same conclusion. Moreover, whilst the skeleton argument seeks to paint the judgment as one which is deficient in its reasoning, in our submission that self-evidently is not the case. The judge was careful in reaching his conclusions as to the credibility or lack of it of the part of Mr. King, relying not just on the oral testimony of Mr. Evans, as the skeleton wrongly suggests, but instead assessing such evidence and Mr. King's evidence in light of the relevant documentary material. Your lordships will see by way of example that in paragraph 122 of the judgment, which is at page 82 of the full bundle, that the learned judge sets out in 32 numbered subparagraphs his careful consideration of relevant documentary evidence, identifying how and why they support his conclusions. Now, my lord, it's against that material background that we wish to make a few short points in relation to grounds 1 and 6, before turning to the reverse substance of grounds 7 and 8, not least because we've, within the points made in support of grounds 1 and 6, our various complaints about the conduct of Mr. Downs. So if I may, I'll say to the order in which they're addressed in the skeleton argument, rather than directly to the points that I'm trying to address to the lordships. As to grounds 1 and 3, essentially both of these go to whether or not the judge was correct to find that the Range Rover transaction constituted a bribe. Even leaving aside the fact that the articulated grounds relate to the judge's findings of fact, the judge made clear in paragraph 143 of his judgment, which is at page 101 of the core bundle, that given his findings in relation to breach of duty, it was not necessary for him to determine the bribery claim to be separate from the cause of action. The lordships see that in the middle of paragraph 143 of Roman numeral 2. So accordingly, whilst he nevertheless determined that it did constitute a bribe, these asserted grounds should not be dispositive of an appeal in any event. We also note that insofar as paragraphs 13 through to 17 of the skeleton argument comprise a positive allegation that Mr. Downs misled the court, as well as a bold and unfair assertion that Mr. Telemach had given perjured evidence, we make the point that the context was that Mr. Downs was making closing submissions referable to the evidence which the court had heard and in the presence of Mr. King's counsel. That Mr. King was inviting the court to reach a different conclusion in relation to such evidence is, your lordships may think, a not uncommon feature of hard court litigation. And the allegation that Mr. Downs misled the court is essentially an attack on the judge's findings of fact and a refusal by Mr. King to accept, sorry, forgive me, and a refusal of the judge to accept Mr. King's differing closing submissions. Your lordships have been taken to a very short excerpt from Mr. Telemach's evidence, evidence at page 248 of the supplemental bundle. My lord, in relation to that short extract, it is said in our submission unfairly that Mr. Telemach accepted that he had given untrue evidence. My lord, in our submission, that does not withstand scrutiny and 
with um, uh, with making an appropriate submission. Your lordship can see in relation to the paragraph it's highlighted that it is put to him that it would be unfair if a witness statement uh, had been made which was untrue. Uh, the witness, unsurprisingly, accepts that the master commission has set its prohibition. What what the letter from the commission doesn't do is to tie down any admission to Mr. Kellerman that his own evidence was untrue. Uh, even leaving aside uh, the dangers to all this was uncertain in terms of viewing an isolated extract in the country uh, of evidence. Um, my Lord, moreover, insofar as heavy reliance is sought to be placed in the skeleton argument uh, on what we submit as a very slight misstatement of the transcript, uh, and assuming, of course, that both Mr. Dowd's Kelly's submissions were accurately recorded in the transcript. Uh, if your lordship looks at the lordship has it read the transcript at pages two hundred and eighty-six to two hundred and eighty-seven. <laughs> Transcript itself was in front of the judge. So Mr. Downs was reading uh, from the transcript which the judge uh, had in front of him. And insofar as Mr. Downs may have misspoken, not only does the citation relied upon uh, suggest that Mr. Downs actually corrected himself, as the Lordship can see at the bottom of line 25, that this answer I did end up knowing how much, and then it says how the Range Rover. Yes, the complaint that's made is the use of the expression how much rather than how. So Mr. Downs not only appears to correct himself, um, emphasis is then placed on the fact that Range Rover at the top of the page line one is in the singular rather than the plural. Um, with respect in circumstances where the next word is were rather than was, uh, the idea that that was a deliberate misstatement by Mr. Downs in an attempt to mislead the judge uh, is thoroughly uh, unfair. And in our submission, it's a classic example of this particular little bit of to make or to prove a point where none exists. Moreover, had Mr. Green's counsel perceived at the time that the court was being misled by that citation from the transcript to the judge, he would no doubt have intervened and all corrected the position in due course. Uh, and my Lord of Justice Potter has already made the point to my learned friend that uh, in any event, Um, as regards the issue of quantum raised in the skeleton argument uh, and Mr. King's assertion that the judge's comment that the point would need to be pursued by way of an appeal somehow conveys a recognition on the part of the judge that it might have been wrong, uh, your lordships can see that from paragraph 9 of the consequential judgment, uh, the extract for which is the final page uh, in the supplemental bundle. <coughs> Yes. Paragraph 9, that far from uh, the judge giving the impression that it's a meritorious ground of appeal, what he's making clear is that he's already made a factual finding as to the relevant sum based upon the evidence submitted to the side, which was accepted uh, by Mr. King in cross examination. And whilst reliance is now sought to be placed to cite Mr. King on pleadings which identified uh, but notably, not definitively, and the Reverend Friends already showed you what the lang language where it refers to an estimate uh, rather than a precise sum. Uh, so, whilst reliance is sought to be placed on that and on a higher sum, a notably higher sum, in correspondence from November 2018, none of that addresses the fact that that predates the evidence. Nor was it challenged uh, by Mr. King's counsel in his examination of Mr. Forsyth. It was accepted by Mr. King himself in his own cross examination of the judge notes, and nor was it challenged by Mr. King's counsel in the course of closing the submissions. Uh, your Lordship can see that at page 283 of the supplemental bundle, as well as the discourse at the bottom of page 21 over to page 22, uh, where the figure. 
figures are directly being spoken about. This is my law, uh, this is in 2000 law, my learned friend constantly says 47,000 figure, I thought it was clear the same as 40,000, 40,000 47, the 47,000 figure was based on earlier estimates, the actual details we got, the figure I put to the king was 466, that's the correct figure, that Mr. Meaney's response to that I'm sorry, it's my fault. I'm not. I'm oh, afraid I haven't quite so cottoned on where you're reading from. I'm conscious I am doing it. Trying to speak. Page 283. Of the 283. Oh, sorry, I, I misheard that as 183. Sorry, 283. Line 23 in internal pagination 21, through to line 4, page 22. Thank you. And again, as my Lord Justice Popperwell's already put to my learned friend, uh, none of that addresses the point uh, that PCH in any event in incurred the risk of a shortfall at the outset. And so, at best, the complaint is now being made by Mr. Green is that, in fact, the judgment against this would have been in a higher time. And my, my Lord has already made the point that uh, this issue goes in any event to the finding of whether or not there was a bribe. As the judge made clear, uh, it was not necessary to the time. My lords, in relation to ground two, which attacks the judge's findings as to breach of duty by seeking to challenge the judge's evaluation of the evidence, uh, with respect, it's wholly unfair to submit, as Mr. King does in paragraph 19 of his skeleton argument, that it hinged on the uncorroborated testimony of Mr. Evans, for the reasons that I've already noted at the outset. The judge was self-evidently careful in his evaluation of the evidence, and whilst Mr King might disagree with the outcome, it cannot be said that no reasonable judge could have reached the conclusion that he did. Uh, the points were squarely put to Mr Evans in cross-examination. The judge expressly recognised there were grounds to doubt the credibility of Mr Evans, yet he made the factual finding that he did. Moreover, the fact that each and every argument that may have been put on behalf of Mr. King does not feature in the judgment, cannot mean that the judgment is somehow unfounded. If that was the case, judgments following trials wouldn't necessarily have to run through tens of hundreds of pages uh, dealing with each and every point raised in favour of the commissioner. The requirement of it is, which is relied upon by my learned friend Ross Skeleton, um, is simply that the essential issue raised by the parties be addressed by the court, and no criticism can be levelled against the judge uh, in that respect. Again, the assertion made in paragraphs 27 to 30 of the skeleton argument that Mr Downs made inaccurate submissions to the court is with respect wholly misplaced. Uh, Mr King asserts uh, that the court was induced by factually inaccurate submissions to conclude that Mr Evans believed that the profit share to be zero. My lords, the private messages between Mr Evans and Mr King did evidence a shared mistaken belief that the profit share was nil and that therefore there was no harm to KSSL's position. Uh, your Lordship can see that, paragraph 122, subparagraph 5 of the judgment at page 84 uh, of the Tor Bundle, where the judge uh, sets out one of the particular messages, uh, where Mr. Evans says, uh, only that King uh, wants him to look at the profit share, but with all the vehicles that go back, etc., the cast on might have also be value the used car market. There is no money to share, so they're providing the car for nothing. Basically, this is why they're taxing fat. Uh, and the judge uh, goes on to note in the following paragraph uh, that Mr. King did not respond to that message with any expression of surprise or any question regarding the profit share. The Lordship can see that at the top of uh, page 85. And the submission in this regard is regrettably yet another of Mr. King taking the position that because he asserts a different view of the evidence, Mr. Downs has improperly misled the court. Uh, indeed, Mr. King does not dispute that Mr. Evans said the profit share uh, was zero. Um, that's emphasised in the skeleton argument. But Mr. King somehow concludes and submits that those messages can only be read as showing that Mr. Evans was misleading Mr. King. And with respect, that's simply a blinkered analysis of the evidence, which ignores the functions and conclusions of the trial judge. Uh, and it's wholly unfair to suggest that such circumstances can stand in favour of the court. Uh, as to 
as to ground four, uh, the judge's reasoning in our submission in relation to the application of the Liverpool number two, the paragraph 123 to 100 of his judgment, is impeccable. Uh, and to succeed uh, on this ground of appeal, Mr. King would have to say that such authorities are wrong. In relation to ground five, uh, in so which concerns Mr. King's assertion that the judge was wrong to refuse a monetary counterclaim, um, the effect of the judge's factual findings is that Mr. King acted dishonestly in breach of his duties to the company. The consequence of that, as I think has already been put, uh, well, I understand uh, uh, your lordship, is that KS Estelle would have been entitled to dismiss him instantly for gross misconduct, as it did Mr. Evans. Indeed, at the very latest, it knows that it's in a position to have dismissed Mr. King for gross misconduct by the time it issues the bribery. And accordingly, not only was the counterfactual now relied upon, <laughs> namely that there would have had to be a detailed investigation followed by a period of notice such that Mr. King pretends that he should have been entitled to his 55 month salary, not only was it not raised at the trial, it, it wouldn't have any merit. The pleaded case advanced a different counterfactual that but for the settlement agreement, Mr. King would have been able to sue for unfair dismissal. That was clear from Readings. Your Lordship can see that at page 173 of the core bundle. Uh, and the judge rejected that at paragraph 185 of his judgment. Moreover, the fact that it was not pleaded and not raised is emphasised again uh, in the consequential judgment uh, of the judge below, at paragraph uh, 67. I believe uh, Your Lordship have those paragraphs again in the supplemental uh, bundle. Um, you only have part of six, as it happens. Uh, um, <laughs> your Lordship has an, an additional bundle which was placed on the bench uh, this morning. It's perhaps uh, misleadingly titled the Respondent's Authority Bundle. What it contains, uh, for your Lordship's benefit, is a redacted version of the judgment on consequential matters which are not below. The judgment of Mr. Justice Cockrell in the Commercial Court today, the order of Mr. Justice Cockrell, and then the order. Thank you. That's all very helpful to have that. Paragraph 6 to 7 can be found at pages 2 to 3, where the judge um, there notes uh, that the counter execution arguments were raised explicitly for the first time in Mr. Newman's skeleton arguments so late on the day before the hearing on consequential matters. Uh, and he makes the point that had it been raised earlier, uh, it would have needed to be subject to disclosure and written statements. And then he uh, notes in paragraph 7, which completes the point that I've just made uh, to your lordship. And as regards the challenge to the judge's factual findings in relation to Mr. King's assertion that the settlement agreement has been affirmed, uh, again, as I say, it comprises a challenge to the judge's factual findings. And the judgment at paragraphs 182 to 283 show no error of principle uh, in that regard. As to ground six, the decision to refuse the Granger and Stowe counterclaim, uh, not only would this, this is extremely ambitious as a matter of law, uh, see the detailed analysis of the authorities set out in the judgment at paragraphs 210 through to 229, but as the judge made clear, see for example paragraph 229 of the judgment, given his findings on the facts, it was unnecessary for him to even decide whether the tort is committed if the predominant purpose is improper or whether a proper purpose will negate any improper one because Mr. King failed to establish on the facts that the proceedings were brought for any improper purpose. And although under this heading, further attacks are notably uh, made against Mr. Downs. Paragraph 47 of the skeleton argument he is said to have improperly interrupted a witness, a complaint which was also made to the judge, which your lordship can see at paragraph 231.1d of the judgment, at page 132 of the core bundle. At the very bottom of the page, uh, notes the complaint uh, through counsel intervening to stop 
people damaging art was emerging in particular during the cross examination uh, of Mr. Townley. Uh, moreover, my lords, it's plain from the transcript itself, which your lordships will find at page 239 uh, of the supplemental bundle, that all Mr. Downs was trying to do was to ensure that the witness, Mr. Townley, had a proper opportunity to read a lengthy email being put to him before answering questions when the witness had previously said that he didn't know what the document was. Your Lordships can see that this is at page 239 uh, of the supplemental bundle at the very bottom of internal page 130. The witness is saying, oh, I don't understand what this is. An email from Anthony Seaman to Special Inquiries mailbox. I do not know what the content is. I do not understand follows a series of questions and then complaint is made about the highlighted uh, passages on page 132 when Mr. Downs intervenes and says if the witness is going to be taken to this document, he has to have a fair opportunity to look at it. At this moment, Mr. Townley will email Mr. Townley's question. Uh, and then at the bottom of the page, Mr. Downs again, no, I do not think I can, Mr. Justice, because I didn't examine on it, because the witness should be given a fair opportunity to look at the whole email in order to construct what he thinks it's referring to or what was and has been seen on this sheet, and then we exchange opinions. Uh, so, again, <laughs> my lords, uh, nothing improper about that. Paragraph 51 of the skeleton argument then accused Mr. Downs of misleading the judge in closing submissions in circumstances which again relate to the notice and history upon which the parties have different views. Uh, it's a complaint about what was said, uh, in particular. Um, Paragraph 318F of the written closing submission, with which your lordships can see the extract, page 269. <coughs> uh, so since October 2017, the Crown King's Party has been in possession of an independent valuation of the Sing shares, which attributes only hope value of 5 to 10,000 to these shares and is very modest value of 1,160,000 to the order of shares. And then adjustment to the documentation. There's simply nothing factually inaccurate about that. Uh, my Lord, that brings me um, at a canter, uh, I'm afraid, but it does bring me to ground seven and eight. Ground seven, as we understand it, comprises a freestanding complaint that the decision was unjust simply because Mr. Downs was acting for my client's care of And for these purposes, Mr. King relies upon a claim which he and his parents initiated in the commercial court, alleging fraud and unlawful means of court, which they served upon Mr. Downs and indeed others after the present claim by Care Sidwell was underway. Such claim, as your lordships now know, has been struck out. Not only has it been struck out by Mrs. Justice Cockerell, it was exceptionally certified by her as having been totally without merit. Um, your Lordships can see that on the face of the sealed order of the additional binding which we provided to your Lordships this morning, page 111, the kind of hope to tab three. So it's the last recital at the bottom of page 111 before we're going to call it out. So upon the court's terming and recording that the claim is totally without merit. Your Lordships will appreciate uh, the exceptional nature of such a certification. Uh, moreover, uh, Mr. King's application for permission to appeal that determination was robustly dismissed by Lord Justice Clark yesterday. Again, your Lordships have that order uh, behind the tab four within that bundle. Uh, and uh, I note uh, the first sentence of paragraph one the judge demonstrated in a conspicuously detailed and patient judgment. This claim is thoroughly misconceived. Uh, and again, as we have in ground two, uh, the Justice Mill agrees that the case is an abuse of discretion. Uh, and I would commend the full stance of the Justice Mill's uh, order to your Lordships. Uh, but there can be no doubt at all uh, that that claim should never have been brought. Now, did, did, did Lord Justice Mill certify the application for permission as totally without merit? Um, 
I don't think he did. Believe he, he has done so separately. Um, well, he hasn't done it. I mean, I just asked him really whether he's done so as part of his reasons. I don't know. Um, I Am suspect I not, the answer not is no. Using that language, no. no. I, I think his lordship there has used the language of saying being thoroughly misconstrued. Yes, quite. I mean, that is what, as you know, I mean, totally without merit has a further significance, which. Uh, but, with respect, uh, in my submission, um, let's just keep it simple and reverse this. And, and semantically, we can say it amounts to the same thing. Um, but in any event, uh, if the claim was in the submission, no one was brought. Uh, and in our submission, those factual circumstances themselves ably demonstrate that to prevent counsel from continuing to act for his, his or her client, simply because they are on the receiving end of proceedings subsequently brought by the opposing party, would, with respect, operate as a charter for the issuing of vexatious litigation. There was and is no basis to suggest that Mr Downs, acting as trial counsel for KSSL in a matter against Anthony King, gave rise to any relevant conflict of interest which ought to have precluded him from acting. And indeed, however unenviable his position might have been, in our submission it's simply credit that he continued to serve my client's interests rather than being browbeaten into causing them to have to find other counsel to act for them. Moreover, the point was one which should have been taken, if it was to be taken at all, before the trial went ahead at considerable expense to clear herself. And Mr King's desire to cause Mr Downs to cease acting for my client manifested itself not only prior to the commercial court claim relied upon, uh, but was also expressly raised by him on his behalf, but then never pursued at the pre-trial review hearing before Mr Justice Miles. If I could show uh, your Lordship the letter at uh, pages 180 to 181 uh, of supplemental funding. I mean, I'm not sure whether your Lordship has to have supplemental funding, or uh, if so, it's um, no tabs on ah, okay. my one. Well, page 180 to 181. Yes, thank you. My Lord, that's uh, a letter from Teacher Stern, mind Dr. Solicitor Sir Walker Morris, Mr. King's uh, solicitors, uh, dated 27 October 2020. Begins, we refer to the pre trial review list in the above matter in the window commenced tomorrow, and the last agenda item in your list of matters to be determined, namely Mr. Downs, to receive as claimant to trial account. They also make reference to the skeleton arguments, which are then sent to show uh, your lordships. Uh, the subsequent paragraph says, You may be aware that this is not the first time that your client has attempted to cause Mr. Downs QC and this firm professional embarrassment and so disrupt the legal representation of those on a client's side of this dispute. In the subsequent paragraph, as matters stand, your client has not issued an application against our client or Mr. Downs personally. Mr. Downs is fully satisfied that he's able to act. And this is a matter upon which, upon which both he and our client have taken independent advice, privilege and which is not waived. If an application is to be made in this respect, it should be made in the proper manner, namely with an application letter to draft order and supported by evidence. This is not least because if such an application is to be made, Mr. Downs is also set to go with the king to represent the public extent. Therefore, unless or until an application is made, Mr. Downs will not be addressing the court on this agenda item. Uh, and as your lordships well know, uh, no such application was ever made. Instead, Mr King allowed my client to proceed to incur the costs of an eight-day trial, followed by a consequential hearing, before then uh, we submit egregiously seeking to raise the point by way of an appeal, with a view to seeking a retrial in circumstances where the outcome And insofar as it's alleged under the heading of ground eight that the decision is unjust because of any particular conduct of Mr. Downs at the trial, any such allegations must be viewed in their context and having regard to what, if any, material impact such conduct is alleged to have had on the decision itself. It's not enough, even if it were the case, to say that Mr. Downs would have behaved differently if trial counsel absent the litigation history. With respect to found any ground of appeal, Mr. King must identify improper conduct 
in and of itself, which is said to have had an adverse impact upon the decision. I've already addressed your lordship's in relation to the points which have been made along the way and to the standard headings of grounds one to six. The skeleton argument then makes further points under a few separate headings and the isolated umbrella of ground eight, which are cumulatively said by Mr. Payne to have violated the tenant's right to a fair trial. My lord, the first and general point to be made is that Mr. King was represented by counsel, who plainly had no difficulty in intervening when he felt it necessary, and as can be seen from paragraph 240 of the judgment, no reticence about making submissions that witnesses have given misleading or even false evidence, or any reticence in criticising the way in which Mr. Downs had conducted his cross-examination. Secondly, the matter was tried by a judge, not a jury, who heard and carefully evaluated all of the evidence and made it clear that he did not consider the cross-examination in relation to Mr. King's credit, referable to the evidence given at Mr. Peter's representation trial helpful. Your Lordships can see that at the bottom of page 251 of the Supplemental Bible. My Lord, at the bottom of page internal pagination 176, on page 251, the judge says to Mr. Downs, you shouldn't feel obliged to use up the two and a half days, Mr. Downs, but the two and a half days left for the cross-examination of Mr. King. And I obviously have a discretion to limit cross-examination, particularly with regards to the credit. I'm also anxious not to relitigate the misrepresentation claim. Please bear that in mind as you spend a bit of time you want to spend on the earlier proceeding. What then follows over the page is an answer, quite a long answer, perhaps mistitled an answer. It's more of a commentary given by Mr. King in relation to something he wants to say about something concerning the misrepresentation claim, trial and misrepresentation claim. And then a complaint is made about what's highlighted at page 190, where the judge interrupts. The judge interrupts and says, Mr. King, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this has nothing to do with this case as far as I am concerned. I accept that, sir. I think we should need to get on okay. Now, that passage is relied upon by Mr. King as the judge unfairly preventing him from giving evidence that he wants to. With respect, far from it. The judge stops it because it's simply not relevant. There's nothing unfair about it. And whilst Caius herself did invite the judge to have regard to such cross-examination in relation to the video witness's credibility, no reliance was placed upon any of that cross-examination in the judgment. Your Lordships can see that expressly. Paragraph 44 of the judgment, which is at page 58 of the full bundle, very bottom of the page, the issues raised in the misrepresentation proceedings are not relevant to these proceedings, and I make no findings in relation to them. So, with respect, it cannot be said that reference to those proceedings in any way infects the judge's decision, even if it was somehow improper, which is not. What is improper with respect is the weight that is still sought to be placed by Mr. King in his skeleton argument upon what is continually said to be a witness statement to Howard Smith, and the findings of which, as Justice Cockerell made clear, that it was no such thing as a witness summary. But I don't propose to trouble your Lordships further with that. Similarly, no reliance was placed by the judge on the content or asserted merits of the commercial court claim, which, in any event, as I've shown your Lordships, was in its instance confirmed by the Justice Mayles at the Total Without Merit Heard Proceedings in the Judicial Process. Moreover, insofar as it's asserted in my learned friend's repeated submission this morning that no independent counsel would have referred to such a misstatement of history or the commercial court claim, my Lords, that's obviously misconceived in circumstances where the previous misrepresentation claim concerns the relevant specific group, 
and in circumstances where the other named defendants for the commercial tort claim included three of the directors of sales themselves who were all being cross-examined by Mr. counsel as to their motives in respect to the present litigation. And it's therefore fanciful to suggest that Mr. Downs only deployed such material because he was himself a named defendant. Any other counsel would have deployed it to serve his best advantage. And lastly, as regards the individual matters referred to in paragraph 66, which I anticipate my other friend, Mr. Collinger, may wish to say something about, we just make the following brief points on behalf of KSSL. None of the matters referred to in that paragraph, even if they had any valid foundation, would serve to undermine the judge's decision on the merits. The assertion that a line of cross-examination, which your lordships will see at page 260 of the supplemental bundle, constituted somehow improper mocking of the witness, when it served to emphasise the disparity between Mr. King's ability to recall certain events in great detail, but conveniently not others, was no more than ordinary and effective cross-examination of a witness who had seen his selective memory. Your lordships will see the paragraph which is relied upon by Mr. King at, I think, line 16 on page 59 through to line 5 on page 60. Nothing, again, improper about that. Nor does the passage which is relied upon at page 260 of the supplemental bundle, which your lordships can see highlighted by Mr. King at lines 7 to 11 of J4, nor does that get anywhere near alleging that Mr. King suffered from psychosis, which is the complaint which is made in the appellant's argument. And likewise, the suggestion that Mr. Downs sought to abuse or humiliate Mr. King by using the phrase village idiot is thoroughly unfair. Your lordships will appreciate context is everything. And your lordships can see the context at page 269. Again, the supplemental bundle. And if your lordships, page 29 is the internal pagination. And if your lordships would start at line 6 and go through to line 22, your lordships will see that the phrase was being used for legitimate purposes and in the sense of a stock character. And I want to suggest to you, Mr. King, the truth is that you do pay attention to where you want to and you do absorb details when you want to, but put my energy into what is important to me less. The impression you're trying to give your lordship is that you're some sort of village idiot who doesn't read documents and doesn't think about things is just a false impression, isn't it? I resent that remark, calling you a village idiot. No, I'm saying the very opposite of that. You're not a village idiot. You're a highly intelligent man, a driven man, but because there are damning documents there, you falsely try to give the impression that you haven't read them or thought about them. So far from suggesting that Mr. King was himself such a character, the point which is being made is the reverse, namely that his evidence that he signed documents without reading them were implausible. And with respect, even if, with hindsight, it might be thought preferable for Mr. Downs to have used a different phrase, and even if it had unintentionally caused any offence, it does not undermine and cannot undermine the judge's own careful evaluation of all of the evidence and accordingly his ultimate conclusion as to the credibility of Mr. King's evidence. And as for the asserted conduct complaints which have been made, which are said to go to substantive grounds, I've already addressed your lordship's consideration of those along the headings of 1 and 6 and why in our submission they take into no way. My lord, I fear I've slightly overrun my time and there's no statement of the time to be, but for all those reasons, unless I'm prompted with anything further from Mr. Hines, we respectfully submit the dismissal of the appeal should be affirmed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Addy. Yes, Mr. Holland. Thank you very much for the intervening, Lord. I'll be very short and light at that. The Kings or their solicitors complained on many occasions about Mr. Downs acting against them. They complained in relation to his acting in the cost assessment proceeding. He said he had a conflict there. They complained about him acting in the stay application in the cost assessment proceeding. They complained about him acting 
on the indemnity costs application on the application for a stay. They complained to the Bar Standards Board about his acting in conflict, and Mr. Downs wasn't called upon to respond. And then, as your Lordships have seen, first of all, at the in their skeleton for the pre-trial review, I, I don't want to go back to that because your Lordships have seen that document, um, a, an application was foreshadowed to bar Mr. Downs from acting, uh, but having raised the matter, no application was made. And then at the trial, again in counsel's skeleton for the trial of the bribery action, the issue was raised once again, uh, and once again, not uh, no application made at the trial. Um, now, it was my submission to Mrs. Justice Cockrell that the reason that Mr. Downs was sued could readily be inferred to have been a desire to conflict him out uh, from acting against the King in further litigation. Uh, notwithstanding the various, uh, the, the large number of complaints made in skeleton arguments and correspondence, the King's decided not uh, and elected not at any stage to make an application to court to seek to disbar or injunct Mr. Downs from acting. Now, what a litigant, of course, if a, such an application had been made, one of the things that would have been said in response was that the action and the proceedings and allegations against him were being made in order to try and conflict him out. What a litigant cannot do, in my submission, which would be unfair, is what is what Mr. King did. On the one hand, at every conceivable uh, occasion, complained that Mr. Downs should not be acting because he had a conflict, and then elect not to make an application for an injunction, but to keep it in their back pocket as a ground for appeal. And that is exactly what has been done in this case. Uh, and that is, uh, gross, uh, that is entirely in inappropriate and improper in my submission. Um, I don't know, I probably don't need to go to Jeveron, which is the, the leading case in respect of counsel, uh, counsel having a conflict in these sort of unusual circumstances. Um, it, I, I, again, I perhaps don't take, need to take you to it. It's, it's tab five of Milan Friends Authority. But one of the points that uh, Lady Justice Arden, as she then was, uh, made in, uh, it's in a reference, it's tab five in paragraphs 42 and 43, Thank you. One of the references, she, one of the points she made is that a, a judge should not uh, too readily, 43, accede to an application by a party to remove the advocate for the other party. It's obvious that such an objection can be used for purely tactical reasons and will inevitably cause inconvenience and delay in the proceedings. So um, that, uh, it was in those circumstances where there was the strongest possible thinking that exactly that was being done in this case, that it was important that if an application was was to be made, that it be made and not, as I put it, kept in um, and then it kept in the king's back pocket for appeal. So that's the circumstance in which they come to. Now, um, they then say that actually it was the conduct of Mr. Downs in the course of the action and his comments and cross-examination and the like which feeds this ground. Um, Learned Friend um, gave two, uh, relied on two matters in his submissions today, having put a lot in his, in, his gra in his written grounds. The first of all was that Mr. Downs asked in cross-examination of Mr. King in the bribery action whether he wanted to change in the evidence he had given to Mr. Justice Marcus Smith in the original misrepresentation act action in 2017. And in fact, Mr. And it, 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 it turns out it's, it's supplemental 251. Um, and Mr. King said he did. And um, the, that, that was a relevant question, first of all, because uh, in the bribery action, Mr. King's credit was central. And secondly, your lordships will remember there was an abuse of process counterclaim. And therefore motivation and circumstances in which the action was brought and continued by, um, uh, by the company were important. A lot of friends seemed to think that the, uh, the problem with that was it relied on Mr. Downs' personal knowledge in respect to the 2017 action, 
uh, he didn't appear to realise that the transcripts of that action were in front of the court, and therefore Mr. Downs was in exactly the same position as anybody else. So that was that one. The other one was that uh, in, in the course of cross-examination of Mr. King, what Mr. Downs uh, compared was what Mr. King had asserted in the past to be the value of the company at the relevant time, which was $9 million, with what he asserted in other proceedings, which was $73 million. Now, um, what, again, learned friend, that was based on an error by my learned friend, because what he said was that was the case in the action Mr. Downs was party to. But it's not, because you can see that at page S261. I'm afraid he's got this one wrong as well. Because if you look at page 261 of, of the supplemental, which is uh, page 131, um, the 73 million, which is the comparator, again, which was said to go for credit because of the, the, the differential in the figures, page 131, line 11, you can see that this is in the DWF action, which was the action against his own lawyers, alleging misconduct against them, rather than in the... the the King Steeple action, where he refers to the valuation of the business at 73 million. So, that, that, so that's what he's asking about there, uh, and not the action. Uh, but in any event, uh, it, with, with great respect, these are matters in the public domain, uh, and there's nothing inappropriate in respect to that. Now, those were the only two matters my learned friend relied upon in his oral submission. Now, there are quite a lot in writing which referred to. Some of them have been dealt with by well, then, my friend, Miss Addy, um, I, I, given the time, I mean, I, I simply ask your lordship, because they were, none of them were ventilated orally, is there any particular matters that you would like me to deal with? I'm, I'm in a position to deal with all of them that were put in writing, if your lordship would, would like assistance on any of them. I don't think we need any further chapter and verse. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Well, in that case, Lord, um, I've, I, I've got a list of them. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yes, Mr. Solomon. Three very short points, if I may. One in of course. response to a learning from Mr. Hollander, and two in response to a learning from Ms. Addy. Uh, on that last point that Mr. Hollander made to your lordship, so I've got it wrong, the quantum in the DWF claim that we claim against Mr. Downs is the same, and that was part of the consideration that Mrs. Justice Cockrell um, considered in her judgment. So it's the, exactly the same quantum that was being cross-examined on. So with great respect, I, that isn't a mistake of mine. Uh, in respect of Miss Addy's submissions, um, first, uh, she dismissed the question and answer of Mr. Telemach as a hypothetical question and answer. And with great respect, that can't be right if, if the uh, answer, the question and answer is actually read um, because it's saying the, the question is just give me the page number again it's page sorry 248 the supplemental by the internal page 50 okay. the question is line 16 you can see it's really a bit unfair to put to a, wit a witness statement before the court in a case against Mr King isn't it saying you're all very frustrated about an apparent deal behind your backs when that wasn't true. And that's obviously quoting from the actual witness statement that was put before the court. But the context, my lord, is if, if you go back a page at 247, internal page 46, uh, your lordship can see at line 15, question is not really fair to say that was behind your back, is it? No, it wasn't. It was just with time frames. I didn't really remember it at that point. Question, so why have you described it as being behind your back when it was something you knew about? The answer is I don't know. This wasn't a hypothetical question. It was a direct question about the witness statement being untrue. And lastly, my lord, very, a minor point, but perhaps some ongoing significance. Uh, Miss Addy was right to say that the certification um, of totally without merit was exceptional uh, by M Mrs Justice Cockrell um, when asked whether Lord Justice Mayles has certified the appeal as totally without merit her response was it's a distinction without a difference 
with great respect, that's wrong. Uh, there is uh, a body of law about the difference between claims being um, subject, for example, to summary judgment or dismissed, and those which are totally without merit. Uh, and there is a huge difference of uh, effect if a claim is certified as totally without merit. Lord Justice Mayles can be taken to have the point well in his lordship's mind because he was considering a case which itself was certified. And the fact that his lordship didn't so certify it uh, is telling, and it's not a distinction without a difference. Uh, those are the points I would make, my lord. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Mr. Solomon, I think. So I think that, I think, completes the submission. Thank many thanks to all counsel for keeping within the, pretty much within the time frame which I suggested. Um, what we will do now is briefly arise to consider where we go from here. I Justice Popplewell will give the first judgment.
I would refuse permission to appeal because none of the grounds, in my view, has a real prospect of success, despite Mr Solomon QC's valiant attempts to argue otherwise. As to ground one, this is a challenge to findings of fact which were open to the deputy judge. In any event, the knowledge of Mr Pownall or Mr Telemac would not have negatived secrecy in the absence of disclosure to the board. As to ground two, this is a challenge to findings of fact which were open to the deputy judge on the evidence. The evidence of Mr Evans, which the judge accepted, uh, was not, as was suggested, uncorroborated. It was supported by the texts for which the deputy judge held that Mr King had no satisfactory explanation and supported by the judge's finding, in my view a powerful one, at paragraph 27, of the inherent improbability of, of a man of the intelligence of Mr King with an eye for detail, as Mr King had, believing that Mr Evans had just got a good deal out of TCH in securing a £74,000 Range Rover on lease for £100 a month. As to ground three, the figure which the judge adopted for the foregone profit was profit share was verified in Mr Forsyth's witness statement and accepted as correct by Mr King in cross-examination. The judge was therefore entitled to proceed on the basis that that was the correct figure. If uh, it was incorrect and the figure should have been the higher figure of about 47,000, uh, then uh, the correct sum to have awarded would have been a higher sum, and that cannot assist Mr King. Mr Solomon's submission, as I understood it, was that using the lower figure undermined the judge's conclusion that TCH had been taking a risk on the amount of the profit share, uh, a, a conclusion which the judge used in relation to his finding of bribery. But as it seems to me, uh, the difference in the profit share figures cannot undermine that element of the judge's reasoning. The judge's reasoning was that there was a risk of the profit share not meeting the value of the Range Rover. That was at a time when the final profit share could not have been known to anyone. The amount of the profit share, which was only calculable with hindsight, whether that be the 40,000 figure or the 47,000 figure, that does not undermine the existence of the risk at the outset upon which the judge relied. As to ground four, in my view, this is unarguable in the light of the Liverpool number two and Halverson and Deptford Bank. The judge's reasoning was impeccable and the facts of this case are indistinguishable from those in the Liverpool number two itself. As to ground five, the findings on affirmation were findings of fact which were open to the judge. A claim for counter restitution based on a counterfactual that but for the settlement agreement Mr King would have remained employed is an unpleaded new case not advanced at trial. Moreover, no restitutionary claim could arise because on the judge's findings the entitlement to rescission arose at the date of the settlement agreement as a result of the suppression by Mr King of his own breaches of fiduciary duty. The relevant counterfactual, therefore, is not merely that the settlement agreement would not have been entered into, but also that the suppressed information would have been known to KSSL. It, it is clear that knowledge of that misconduct on the part of Mr King would have justified summary dismissal for gross misconduct uh, and
and on the evidence in the case, it is perfectly clear that that is the course which the directors of KSSL would have taken. As to ground six, the issue of whether there was an improper collateral motive was a question of fact for the judge. The argument is that the judge ought to have found that the motive was to obtain the king's shares at an undervalue. However, the judge found, and he was entitled to find, that that was not a matter which was in the minds of those conducting litigation on behalf of KSSL as any part of the purpose in bringing the claim against Mr. King. As to ground seven, in relation to Mr. Downs QC acting at the trial as leading counsel for KSSL, it is clear that a decision was made by Mr. King and his legal representatives not to make an application before trial that Mr. Downs be debarred from representing KSSL. In the absence of such an application, a complaint that he did so represent KSSL cannot be maintained. An objection to his acting could not be kept in the back pocket of Mr. King for use later in an appeal in the event that he was unsuccessful in litigation. As to ground eight, I am wholly unpersuaded by Mr. Solomon's submissions for all the points made in writing in Mr. Newman's skeleton that Mr. Downs' conduct of the hearing differed from that which would have been proper and would have occurred had a different and, quote, independent, close quotes, counsel have represented KSSL. In my view, the criticisms of Mr. Downs' conduct at the trial are unfounded and provide no arguable basis for a successful appeal. Alleged falsities in Mr. King's evidence in the misrepresentation proceeding were a legitimate subject of cross-examination as going to credit, credit being at the heart of the issue in the current action. The material which was deployed was available from the transcripts and did not depend on any special knowledge which Mr. Downs had. References by Mr. Downs to the unjustified nature of the fraud claim was again something which was available from transcripts and was vindicated by the judgment of Mrs. Justice Cockrell striking out the fraud claim and the disapproving terms in which she expressed criticism of the way it had been advanced and her certification of it being as totally without merit. There is nothing about any of the other conduct complained of which in my view went beyond the bounds of professional propriety and in any event there was no arguable unfairness in the trial process. Accordingly, I would dismiss the application for permission to appear. I agree. I would pay tribute to the measured and realistic way in which Mr. Solomon advanced his client's grounds of appeal but ultimately for the reasons my Lord has given, I am satisfied that none of them displays any reasonable prospect of success. It follows, as my Lord has said, that the application will be dismissed. I'm sorry, there may just be a few matters to deal with first. Can I say this? I well appreciate your ordinary position in relation to costs where a respondent appears on a permission to appear application but with respect, we would invite the Lord to consider making a ruling on my client's favour in circumstances where we submit the nature of the grounds of appeal which were being put forward were exceptional and have required those instructing me to effectively give me instructions as counsel other than Mr. Downs to turn up in this hearing in order to explain to your Lordships why the allegations made are unfounded. There were very serious allegations of professional misconduct against Mr. Downs and it would not have been right for my client not to be here today and we very much hope that each one of us in this office agrees with your Lordship that despite the justifiable reasons for the delay, we will make the best of it. Thank you. Thank you.
to ignore its own appropriate to consider those grounds in light of the commission's extraordinary commission to appear to intervene. As I said, I well appreciate the ordinary rule, uh, but it would be remiss of me uh, in such unusual circumstances not to ask. But the, there is a rider to the general rule in circumstances where the participation of the respondent has been invited by the court. And I, one thing I'm not entirely clear about is what directions Lord Justice Arnold gave or did not give in relation to that. Perhaps you can help me on that. Well, uh, um, well perhaps. I think it's fair to say it's, it has been slightly unclear so much as that to me. If, uh, if I show your Lordship the uh, order made by Lord Justice Arnold, which uh, I think should be... Uh, well, I mean, the terms of the order itself, I think, don't really help on the point. I, but I think that when permission is given, the judge who grants it will often uh, give directions to the office, and they might have been relayed to you. Uh, I think it's right to say, and I'll be corrected uh, from behind if this is wrong, but certainly in communication to the court, what those instructing me were told is that my client was entitled to, but not obliged to attend. Um, I would draw your logic's attention to the particular language and Yes. I'm grateful. Um, I have one with, um, I'm grateful to my own friend, it, and it's not in the bundle, but I do um, have a copy of it in front of me. Um, and your lordships will see that uh, the view was taken that grounds one to six did not appear to have a particular merit, but then half of grounds is thus I'm doubtful as to when, whether any of these grounds yes. are forced to be said, but I'm troubled yes. by grounds seven to eight, which raise serious allegations of sexual misconduct against women. The respondent's answer oh, yes. to these allegations may be entirely satisfactory, may be the breach of the effort, yes, if I was judging the possible, but it's difficult to be sure without a hearing. And in the circumstances, that conclusion from the prior application of permission should be judged in all theory. Um, yep. My Lord, retook that language as meaning that, that, is strong that our answers <laughs> might well prove uh, helpful um, and indeed of interest to the court. Moreover, uh, your Lordships will know, uh, as I believe, my Lord has been granted permission to Mr. Downs, GC, to be separately represented given the specific and unusual nature. So whilst I can't say to your lordships that we've been requested to attend, um, uh, certainly um, in our submission... Well, I think in view of the way in which Lord Justice Arnold expressed himself, I think he was clearly envisaging at any rate that you might well wish to be represented, yes, and that I certainly would, so to speak, have had his blessing. Um, and speaking for myself, I think we've been you know, we've been very much assisted by submissions of all three councils this morning. Um, Mr. Yes. Mr. Sorry, Mr. I, if, if, you know, if the learned friend's finished, I, I will make the same application. We did ask you, as you as yes. Lord Lord Kenderson knows, to appear, and um, uh, my lord was kind enough to permit it. It was obviously in the light of, of what Lord Justice Arnold had said in about paragraph seven and eight. Indeed. And I mean, this is pretty unusual. These are shocking and outrageous allegations that have been made against Mr. Downs. And your Lordship will appreciate the concerns for him personally. Yes. Good. Well, I think we'll. Sorry. Yes. Beg your pardon, Mr. Solomon. No, my Lord, I was simply going to resist those applications, yes. if I may. Of course. Um, the normal approach pursuant to practice direction. 52C, in respect of respondents' costs of commission applications, is that at, at paragraph 20, there will normally be no order for the recovery of the cost of respondents' written statement. In most cases, an application for permission to appear will be determined without the need for respondents to attend the hearing. In such circumstances, an order of costs will not normally be made in favour of a respondent who voluntarily attends a hearing. Uh, if the court directs the respondent yeah. to pass submissions or attend a hearing and normally award cost to respondent if permission is refused. There was no such direction, my lord. Uh, what um, Lord Justice Arnold said in the written order was that he wanted to hear oral submissions from the appellant 
Uh, that's what is clear about that order. And in correspondence, those instructing my learning friend, Miss Addy, applied, as I understand it, for permission to attend. And the response was, Lord Justice Arnold has directed that the respondent is entitled but not obliged to attend the oral permission to appeal hearing. And so that accords with my submission that what Lord Justice Arnold had in mind was submission from the appellant rather than from the respondent. In respect of Mr Hollander's costs, my lord, uh, Mr Hollander's solicitors applied for permission to be here and that was granted subject to uh, those instructing me uh, having a right to object. We did not object but drew attention to the normal cost rules, my lord. Yes. So there was no need for... So the starting position is, my lord, the normal rule which should be followed is that there is no order as to costs. There was no requirement and no order <coughs> for any respondent to attend. Your lordships gain benefit from uh, my learned friends, but no doubt the, could, could have reached the same conclusion without them as Lord Justice Arnold was, uh, it is certainly in respect of grounds one to six. Um, and certainly there is no requirement for two counsel when Miss Addy made submissions about grounds seven and eight, as well as uh, Mr Hollander. So I resist the application for cost in any event, but um, there should be no order as to cost at all in respect of Mr Hollander's cost. Thank you very much. <coughs> I think we will again rise briefly to consider what we do.
again, I will invite Lord Justice Popplewell to give our ruling on this. On the application for permission to appeal on the papers, Lord Justice Arnold said that he was doubtful whether any of grounds one to six had a real prospect of success, but that he was troubled by grounds seven and eight, which raised serious allegations against leading counsel for the respondent. He went on, quotes, the respondent's answers to these allegations may be entirely satisfactory, and it may be that the boot is on the other foot, as suggested by the judgment of Mrs Justice Cockrell, but it is difficult to be sure without a hearing. In the circumstances, I have concluded that the entire application for this permission should be adjourned to an oral hearing. But before us, the uh, respondent, KSSL, has been represented by uh, counsel, uh, having uh, been told via the office that the respondent were entitled but not obliged to attend. Uh, Mr Downs QC has also been represented by the leading counsel, having made uh, an application to be represented at this hearing, which was granted by my Lord, Lord Justice Henderson. Grounds 7 and 8 uh, involve very serious allegations of professional misconduct against Mr Downs. I, I have already expressed the view in my judgment that they are unfounded. The uh, conclusion at which I arrive was uh, assisted and informed by the detail which representation by counsel on behalf of KSSL and Mr Downs was able to provide in relation to what were a large number of criticisms. In my view, therefore, it is uh, appropriate that Mr King should bear the burden of paying the costs of the legal representation on behalf of KSSL and Mr Downs at this hearing. In my view, Mr King brought the attendance of, those, of that legal representation upon his own head by making what were very serious and extravagant allegations of misconduct uh, which uh, it was necessary for the legal representatives to come to court to expose as being serious and extravagant. There were, in my view, a number of the criticisms which it can be seen from the submissions made on behalf of Mr Downs and KSSL uh, were quite unfair and involved a distortion of the uh, material upon which they were based. I, I would therefore order that the applicant is to pay uh, the costs of the attendance uh, at this hearing of legal representatives on behalf of KSSL and Mr Downs, such costs be assessed on a standard basis if not agreed. I agree and our order will therefore contain um, contain those terms. Yes, yeah, sorry Ms. Eddy. Thank you. Well if um, between yourselves you'd be kind enough to agree an order just effectively recording the dismissal of the application and the two orders for costs which we have um, just made. So I think it just remains for me to thank all the council again very much for their assistance this morning um, and we will now rise. Thank you.